Hi, good morning. It's Mark Owen from Moose Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefing show, where I've invited a panel of business experts to review this morning's newspapers, find out what's going on in their own business and their own individual business sector. And finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. We're going to kick off. We've got a fantastic panel. Uh, we've got John Workman, the senior partner of BE Solicitors. They've got over 123 staff uh, with a main office in Chatham. Steve Gardner Collins, sales director of Hatton Court Collection, which includes six hotels and two pubs. He's also director and chair of Visit Gloucestershire. And if that doesn't keep him busy enough, he's also the president of Gloucester Chamber of Commerce. Then we have Talitha Nelson, CEO of Gloucestershire Community Foundation Trust. And she's a bit of a retail guru as well from her past. And finally, last but not least, is Judy Kent, MBE, vice chair of the Pie Piper. Uh, appeal, motivational speaker, and is a bit of a great sax player. And I'm glad I got that right. Anyway, <laughs> on with the show, guys. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. I'm just going to whip through the papers. We've got the Western Daily Press. We hope that it's all about um, Fred West, and they've actually closed the door in that case now. They didn't find anything. And it's one of those mixed blessings, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. you want them to for closure for the family at the same time you'd want them to find something which means that Mary is actually unfortunately no longer here. Let's go into the Citizen newspaper, Our Future of the 85 Million Forum. That's going to start work next week. Very, very exciting. The Daily Mirror, you told them they were safe. This is all the, the um, backlog of the sort of hoo-ha with uh, Dominic Cummings last week, uh, this week. And that carries on. Pressure for Hancock. Again, in the Telegraph, Hancock feels the heat. Again, in the Times, Hancock, but what's a bit more concerning this one is the Indian surge leaves any <coughs> restrictions in mm. doubt. Is that our summer already over? The sun moves completely off, uh, off the boil. Uh, Jesse's snatch of the day, that's Jesse Lingard, the football player, had his watch stolen. <laughs> who cares, who cares? Uh, don't steal our summer, says the Daily Mail. And the paper that I really love at the moment is the Daily Star. Where have you been, Mr. Sun? Anyway, let's move on with you guys. OK, let's start with you, please. Uh, Judy, what have you picked out for today's papers? Yeah, well, sorry, I'm avoiding politics completely. And I always like to try and find something that sort of ties in with our wonderful county. And it sort of does. It's all about Richard Hammond, who bought a two million pound castle in Hereford, um, Bolly Tree Castle. That sounds like something that's been made up, but it isn't. And of course, he's not getting the planning permission to do all the things that he wants to do to it, um, unfortunately. And I always think, you know, we're such an attractive place. If it's not Herefordshire, it's uh, between here and Oxford, isn't it? We've got Michael McIntyre and it attracts all the celebrities to come and live in our lovely county and the shires around us. Um, is it good? for us I wonder do they come to hide you know they want to be big shots in London then they come here and they want to be quiet but if you live in a little sleepy village and you have these famous people living there is it a good thing or not I ask myself maybe people comment on your um on your thing and the other one I've got is um which ties in with the what you did about Amazon um it's Fergie uh, ex Prince Andrew, she's complaining about a new Amazon, you know, a great big Amazon warehouse that's going near her. But the difference is her, to have hers down in Hampshire, 67 oak trees will be cut down, three beech trees, nearly 100 trees are going to be cut down to make this big Amazon warehouse. At least, I suppose, and I don't know what the response was, Mark, when you put on about the new Amazon that's going up the road for me because I'm in Huckleford and Steve. Um, was it positive or negative about the new Amazon warehouse going on up there? It's funny you should say that. It's, it's actually really a lot more positive than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and I totally agree with you. Um, it, 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 really, it really is a mixed bag. You love, we, we kind of damn Amazon because they're going to destroy the high street. On the other side, we all use it. And they're so, yeah. they're so slick. Let's be honest about it. You can phone them up for, you know, order now, and it'll probably turn up around five yeah. o'clock this evening. How the hell can you compete with that? But it's 120,000 square feet. It's going to create 110 jobs here. Jobs, I know. And we I know. All the jobs we can get, really. What's your thoughts, Steve? Well, my asking? thing with Amazon is, and I, I am a, I am an Amazoner because I, over the last year, I've become addicted. I think everything that I don't have to go to the supermarket for, I can just get on Amazon and, and get it delivered the next day. Depending on what. 
um, delivery option they pick. You, you have no control over the delivery. If it's DPD or one of those, you get a slot. And I prefer it if I can maybe do an order on a Friday for a Sunday because it doesn't normally get to Royal Mail. But if it gets to Royal Mail, my heart sinks because I think I've got to be in to make sure it gets to me. Otherwise, it goes to the depot and it becomes a fiasco. Oh. So my thing's delivery on Amazon. It becomes a bit of a pick if it's Royal Mail. Well, you wait till they start getting these little hovercraft things and they're going to have little yeah. and drones and stuff. John, I can't imagine you being some uh, an Amazonian. Is that what you call it nowadays? <laughs> Well, I think Amazonian is something entirely different, but I'm the wrong yeah. sex for it. <laughs> mean, the, um, but, uh, but yeah, I use Amazon all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there are some, you know, some things that uh, the retail experience really matters for, and there's some things it doesn't. But, you know, retailers complaining about Amazon is like um, dinosaurs complaining about meteors. It doesn't make no difference if they complain. It's going to happen. Mm. Very true. Salita, obviously, you've got a... a oh, I've background. made a bit of a stand this year. I'm not trying to be holier than thou, but I don't really admire anyone who doesn't pay their taxes. So, And the other thing is we've decided to try and have a zero carbon footprint. So we have for a year bought secondhand everything. We've bought nothing new if we can possibly avoid it. So I've become an eBay addict. <laughs> <laughs> and literally i'm i have managed to get pretty much everything on ebay secondhand the funniest thing is i was telling my friend i said look i bought everything secondhand he said great because i'm going to buy everything new so you can buy secondhand <laughs> 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 but i do feel i've done a little bit by uh, reducing my carbon footprint and i am as much as it's a necessary evil for some of those things you can't get hold of with Amazon, I've really tried not to buy anything. Well, well I'll tell you what, my wife is a big uh, eBayer as well, and she she likes to buy everything from me. And the Love eBay. She gets, it's quite amazing. Anyway, let's carry on with the newspapers. Thank you guys for the feedback there. Steve, let's go to you next. What have you picked out from the, from the papers, please? In today's Guardian, it's the number of EU citizens that are struggling, or don't you can read it, are struggling to get into the country. Well, that's my coronavirus test kit for work being <laughs> delivered on today. Sorry, it flashed. So, um, yeah, EU citizens are having problems with uh, getting in through the borders for travel, which I guess as a hotelier this year, I'm not worried about right now. I'll go on to talk about another one of your stories later on, no doubt. Um, but naturally, when we're not just thinking about this summer, we're worrying about September <coughs> and autumn and winter, but particularly going into next year when we all probably want to go and get some summer sun, because let's face it, for all of us that have now been like this since March, we're all going to really want to get some sunshine. And I think we're going to have to go abroad to get it at the rate we're going. So when it comes to that period of time in the country, we're going to need to get some citizens over from other countries to come and visit us and holiday with us to top up our, our room numbers and our attraction ticket sales. So I am concerned reading about the challenges that they're facing this year and how prolonged those challenges are at the border. And also the flip side of it with the family, what kind of comes around goes around. They're probably gonna make it even harder for us. Let's look at the Eurovision Song Contest earlier on in, uh, last week. You know, we treat them like rubbish now at, at our border and we're gonna have it really hard with their borders. Let's kind of work together and let's try and uh, and let's try and overcome this limited immigration issue that we've got, particularly when we're desperately going to need it when we're all hungry for the summer and all going abroad. Yeah, totally agree. John, what's caught your eye in the papers today? Well, so, uh, I mean, I, I know we can't avoid Matt Hancock, so let's not. Um, so uh, I mean, the papers are full of him and coming and so forth. But yeah, that's the one which uh, I hope you can see that. Yeah, what the hell happened? Um, and I think when, obviously next year, there's going to be a proper public inquiry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I, for me, it comes down to two things. You know, should we have locked down a week earlier? And yeah, you know, what are the deaths in care homes? Because those, those are the two things. Which, I mean, after that, until it gets September and, and, and lockdown, not lockdown, but yeah, you know, the, the early days of the crisis, you know, those are the... Those are the, I mean, we talked about it many times, even on this programme, I think, but yeah, should the festival have gone ahead in in March? Um, yeah, what about, you know, the, the Liverpool, um, Real Madrid game and all that sort of stuff? Should these things have been happening? And I think and that's that's going to be a battleground. But yeah, the care home thing, um, it, you know, sending people with COVID into care homes is, 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 is you know, I mean, you, know, you might as well try and kill people. Um, so what 
the controversy around that. You know, what did he say? What didn't he say? What was the policy? How fast did it move? I mean, I think all those things are going to be very, very important. I think we're only getting one side of it now from 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 the axe grinder Cummings, um, who, about whom I would say, if, if he thinks that Johnson is so unfit to be prime minister, why the hell did he work for him? Nobody made him. Um, but the um, I think the yeah, it's, it's going to come down to um, a few decisions made by people under huge stress, with a lot going on, um, being spotlighted, um, and you know, was it accident? Um, could it have been avoided? All those sort of things. But yeah, that's going to come out in the wash. Meanwhile, I think Mr. Hancock's got a few questions to answer, and, and it'd be interesting to see how how that develops for the next few days. Yeah, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Definitely watching that. Thanks, John. All right, Tally. Right, okay. What have you got for us today? Well, I found something really interesting. I mean, always I like sort of futuristic stuff, but the first autonomous vehicle joins regular traffic in Cambridge in the UK. I was just like, oh my God, we finally there with these cars <laughs> with no people in them. Um, it's quite extraordinary, really. And, and they were create um, made in Coventry. But the UK's first driverless shuttles have taken to the roads in Cambridge, carrying their first passengers in a trial. So obviously the passengers there for now, but it's going to be completely autonomous. Autonomous. Um, and they took a 20 minute journey around the University of Cambridge, um, around the campus. And I'm just like, this is, I'm not sure I want <laughs> the M25 with a load of <laughs> autonomous vehicles. But, you know, it's quite interesting, all this technology and where we're going with it. So it caught my eye because I just thought, well, it's interesting, isn't it? And the fact that, that, that they've been made in Coventry just up the road. Well, I think that's it. I think Britain is going to lead the field in this, actually. I really do. I think that's what the government's been pushing for and, and good for it as well. Thanks ever so much for that, Tally. All right, let's go over to Julie. Thanks ever so much, Julie. Let's talk about you and what you've been up to. Um, so uh, you've become a bit of a motivational speaker, Julie. I've become one, yeah. Um, I think, you know, I retired from Dean Close and I was trying to decide what to do. And then I was given an MBE and someone said, why don't you start, you know, motivation speaking? Um, and I've been really enjoying it, especially online. And, you know, as soon as I've done one, I kind of, you know, get some feedback and some people have put some lovely recommendations on LinkedIn, which is great. So hopefully at some point I might actually get out and do some motivational <laughs> speaking. But, um, you know, obviously it's all stemmed from me losing my daughter 26 years ago, which started my my charity work, really, which is what I got the MBE for. So, um, you know, I, I'm enjoying it. I started a I was on so many podcasts. I thought I might as well do a podcast. And so it's going out fortnightly. And I agree with you, Mark, you know, half an hour. Mine is about half an hour. And if you walk the dog, I think that's about right. Because some of them are an hour over an hour. And I, I interview people who are successful at whatever they do, but they've got to have also done something for a charity um, or, you know, volunteered. And then it's called What's in the Goodie Bag. So at the end, they have to donate something to go in my goodie bag, which I then auction or raffle for Pied Piper. So, um, and obviously at Pied Piper, I am now the fund fundraiser um, for free which obviously Nick Brody thinks is wonderful to have anyone work for free because we lost ours just before the um the the pandemic and you know I'd already said I would do two days a week when I retired so but I say that to everyone Steve don't I <laughs> oh yeah I'll do a day for you well, uh, I'm always so, nodding at you Julie <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I end up nodding back I know but um you know obviously that's been very challenging to fundraise as Tally will tell you as well um but also I'm with Chartnam Open Door I'm the chairman of Chartnam Open Door and we have found bigger premises now to feed um the vulnerable and the homeless in Chartnam because our, our numbers have almost doubled and our building is a big enough so and I know nothing really about change of use or any of those kind of things so um we, that's an interesting roller coaster, but we are moving to Allstone Business Park too. And we're right near P3 that we send our guests to, to get home, you know, to get housing and everything. So I've got a lot going on, Mark, really. <laughs> you haven't retired at all, have you? No, really? not at all. <laughs> not at all. No. You've um, obviously opened that, um, you're about to open the, the other Pied Piper shop as well, aren't you? Yeah, I would say in the next 10 days, hopefully, we'll be opening our um, second shop in Hucklecote. We put it out on um, the Hucklecote group and got lots of abuse from people that live in Hucklecote, saying, we want a post office, we don't want another charity shop. Um, but we'll be opening definitely in the next 10 days. It's big, 
Um, really big thanks to Premier Kitchens, who gave us loads of units and workshops that look beautiful. Um, Parcel Electrics, they came and done all the electric stuff. You know, it's been absolutely brilliant, really. And we can't wait because the Brockwood one, we're really part of the community there. And we want to be part of the community in Hukoko as well. So, yeah, Pied Piper is <laughs> doing well. And we've, we're just about to do a play area at the Shrubbery School in Stonehouse. It had been condemned for the young children, health and safety. And uh, we've, we've pledged um, money to get that done in half term, hopefully, so that they can play there again. Yes, that's great. Fantastic, Julia. Keep keep going. And I know that uh, that my wife and I, we're, we're very happy to come down and, and support you as well and, and uh, help out one of the shops too. So You're on my list. <laughs> forever. I can't imagine <laughs> not being on your list. Let's go over to Steve now. Steve, thanks for joining us as well. Goodness gracious, you're running all these hotels, you're running all the pubs, you do all this other stuff. Tell us about the hotel trade and how that's gone now that you've sort of got <coughs> that, please. Uh, since we've gone back indoors, April, when, you know, I've done, I was on this before, I think uh, just over a month ago, and the weather wasn't great, and therefore we were struggling as pubs particularly to do anything outdoors. Trying to stay open even two days a week was a challenge, but we're indoors now. I think um, going back to last Monday, uh, 10 to 12, just about to open, queue of people, and I was panicking actually for me and the staff, particularly when you're, when you're, um, colleagues are of an age where they're all in their early 20s and I haven't really well I have we've, we've got lateral flow galore going on but um I haven't really factored in the onus of the guests and um, and their attitude and how it affects the staff so they've all come back most of them have come back to work we've got some anomalies who choose to stay on furlough we'll go through that in a minute but the guests all rock up they're ready in, they're in for lunch they're all their masks are off and they're getting up and down to go for lunch they're no masks so I'm to remind them and then there was this um period of two or three days last week of people just saying well i've had both vaccines now i don't need to wear it forgetting the fact that the person serving them hasn't had even an inkling of, of time yet in terms of when they're going to get their vaccine so there is a responsibility there to just not do it for for themselves but to do it for those people that are serving in hospitality if this goes wrong you will bring the sector to a grinding halt again and nobody wants to have the pubs and the restaurants closed so we've got to play our part particularly when we're indoors and that that fell by the wayside coming to a really good week this week accommodations doing really well across gloucestershire um and as are the pubs because we're indoors i was hoping for a really sunny bank holiday but i'm looking out the window thinking friday might be a flop but the weekend uh, weather forecast i was just checking quickly earlier is nice and sunny so for the sector uh, it is looking good i'll talk about your billions of pounds first if i may yeah because um you did a uh, you reported this week in punchline that the colliers um predicted a 22 billion five billion kind of cap there in terms of what we've got left and i think that's a great outlook for the sector i've no doubt across the southwest particularly so more southern than us i have to hasten to add looking at the stats um i think devon and cornwall will definitely benefit from that staycation the coastal regions are so busy up here in gloucestershire we're kind of sitting on a three night shoulder night at the moment so we've got people staycating on leisure maybe one or two nights max and they're kind of drifting between cornwall and devon and coming back past us that's why they're in the area so i think that the sector itself will benefit from that 22 billion of, of how much of it Gloucestershire gets, we get to see. Um, and then should we talk about furlough? That's yeah, well, that's it, because there's a story in the, in the Western Daily Press, staff furlough levels fall to 8% of the workforce now, 2.2 million people. But there's, uh, I was talking to a recruitment person yesterday, and uh, he was saying to me, that this is absolutely ridiculous what the government's done, keeping furlough going till September. We know there's lots of problems about staff not wanting to come back. Um, some are frightened, some have actually been paid 80% of their salaries and don't think they need to come back. What's your, what's happening in your sector? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're experiencing just that. We've got uh, colleagues that don't want to come back, they're happy to be on furlough until September. They even request it, whether it's because they feel unsafe, albeit that we are in a really kind of COVID secure environment. I have to remember that last year when hospitality opened, 
very, very limited uh, stats came out around the spread of the virus through hospitality. So we have to sit in comfort that we're following all the guidance and the staff are as protected as they can be. It's almost like going into hospital. They are PPE'd and everything up to the hilt. Uh, we're not overly hospitality right now, are we? Back away, we can't come near you, we're all on tablets. So um, the interesting flip side of it is, yeah, people are staying on furlough 80% until it goes down to 70 and then 60 later on in the season. Um, but there's a 95% surge in job adverts at the same time. So we've kind of got this huge battle now where people are skilled colleagues sitting on furlough with all these jobs across the sector available for, for others to fill. But the sector hasn't done itself uh, hasn't done itself any favours with the zero hour contracts and the minimum wage of the past. And I know that for many hoteliers and, and publicans and everybody, we are seriously consider what we can afford to pay staff and not have to zero hour if we can have some consistency. But our sector is very much about um, weather and uh, buoyant weekends and quiet midweeks. So salaries have always been considered that way. But um, you have to um, remember that we're not, we're, we're, we're in this world of Groupon and um, pay what you think scenario. And unfortunately, with the buy gifts and the virgin experiences, that hammers all the rates. Low income, low salary. The two go together. So if you want to pay 200 quid for your room in a lovely country house hotel, your staff will be getting a really good wage. But if you're only willing to pay 69 quid, there is not enough left to even pay somebody minimum wage on that rate. So it goes hand in hand. Expect higher rates if you want better pay. And that is a very nice link to a man who's actually sitting in a hotel in Hampshire. So thanks for that. Could have done it better myself. John, <laughs> that leaves us with a furlough and obviously being a large firm of solicitors, I would imagine that you guys are going to be pretty busy um, trying to deal with this mess from both sides. From yeah, yeah. Well, well, it, well indeed. And a nice segue, by the way. I'm indeed sitting uh, in a hotel in Hampshire, but uh, for the completely non-business purpose, I went fishing yesterday. But the, um, yeah, I mean, as a business ourselves, clearly we 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 have um, we use the furlough scheme and, and save many jobs by doing it in the in the in the depth of the crisis. Um, we do have people who genuinely genuinely are either vulnerable. Uh, I won't mention names, but we have one young lady who's had a brain tumour uh, operated on them. Yeah, we're not going to bring her back, are we? Unless we absolutely have to. Um, um, we have um, yeah, people who are genuinely frightened to come back, and we respect that. Um, but we're, we've got everybody working on Zoom anyway. I mean, it's not they're not working; they're just not coming into the office mostly. Um, from a from a uh, from a being a lawyer point of view, we have clearly we have clients across many sectors, um, some in hospitality. Um, um, uh, obviously, but of the but, but, but just about any sector you can think of, and um, yeah, how you get people back when you want them back. Um, yeah, because some jobs you have to do. You, know, you can't you, you can't drive a lorry. As we, we talked earlier. You can't drive a lorry by Zoom um, unless it's autonomous. Um, um, and you've got to, you know, some jobs have to be done, and people need their workforce back. Um, particularly in skilled jobs, because you, know, you can't just train somebody to be, again, a lorry driver overnight. There's a national shortage of lorry drivers. So getting people back in, what, mm. you know, where, do you, where do you step over the line in terms of encouragement to coercion? Um, I mean, I know, I know people who have um, made requ requirement and requests and requirements of staff which are, in fact, illegal. Um, no names, no pack drill. Um, but sadly, in our sector. Um, so the yeah, it, it is. It, yeah, it keeps the employment lawyers busy. Which, since I employ quite a few of them, is a good thing. Um, but it does go to the, um, you know, the, you know, the fundamentals um, in the in, in our labour market, which is that, you know, for, for, for too many people, um, it is too easy not to work. Um, and I think that's you know, that, that cannot be a good thing for the economy. Um, if you were to to, to, to to go back to the immigration point of view and, and EU nationals and so forth, I mean, to what extent um, <laughs> have we filled the gap in, the, in in those who won't work or don't want to work uh, with um, willing labour from elsewhere, which we can't do anymore? And I think that's going to be a problem. It may be a problem for hospitality, agriculture, um, but also you know, there's plenty of factories um, which operate on um, you know, large swathes of, 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 uh, of people from yeah, from, from EU countries in particular, uh, if, we're, if we're keeping those guys out or not letting them stay, who's going to do the work? So yeah, I think we have a, we have a pretty fractured labour market anyway. I think we have a, a, a we have a, a work ethic problem, um, 
and uh, and and, and the, this, this some of this photo thing is just an example of that. I think that's uh, I think you got that spot on. Thanks ever so much, John. Okay, we're going to uh, flip over to uh, Talitha, and obviously working in the charity sector, Talitha. The amount of times I've talked to you about how hard hit your particular sector's been. Has it now that lockdown is out of the way? Have you seen a sort of improvement at all, or are fifty percent of charities still going to go under? That's what we spoke about. Right? No, it's it's interesting actually. <clears throat> it was the ones really with the fifty thousand pound and lower that probably have managed not managed to to stay afloat. And actually, Gloucestershire is very resilient. And when we did our research, it was really interesting to see. Um, the sort of feedback about the next 12 months, but it's when reserves start running out. So most organisations <clears throat> who had fairly healthy reserves sort of thought the next six to 12 months they'd stay afloat. But if revenue streams continue um, to be an issue, we're going to hit the problem probably next year. So it feels like the, it feels like there was a big storm um, and everyone was panicking to get through. Then there was quite a bit of money to help organizations and charities survive and that sort of COVID funding but that COVID funding's ending or it's coming to an end um, <clears throat> then there's a period of um, increased services so as Julie mentions the queues have got longer the need has got greater um, on on and and the pressure is enormous and but our charities are so well run what's so amazing having come from business and sort of hitting march and the pandemic watching our charities pivot in 24 hours and change their business models overnight and the most incredible leaders of organizations delivering support to the most vulnerable where they just wouldn't have got support elsewhere whether it was food and emergency need um, to everything else that's gone on <clears throat> and so what we're finding now is there's a period of um, that the whole support is around what's the future look like how do we plan we have no idea what to do for the future that resilience planning is number one on their list of things to do and then you're looking at when reserves run out and then you're looking at future funding so the government hasn't put anything together for the third sector so the third sector has been completely forgotten so where are we going to get the money from for this huge increase increase need in the charity sector and that i think the problem is going to be where those charities <clears throat> run out of reserves in the next six months what does next year look like um, is there going to be enough money to keep them going are they going to run out of reserves or is there going to be income somehow coming through because the bucket shaking in the events is huge money that keeps the majority of our amazing charities going so you know I, we're not out of the you know we're definitely not out the other side i think we just none of us really quite know what next year is going to look like and it probably is the same feeling as most sectors and i think the big problem that you're going to have the charity sector is going to have the business businesses themselves won't be able to help as much as they have <laughs> done in the past because they themselves are under tremendous pressure cash flow, um, um, people, everything. They're just not going to get the, the, the chance to like they've done in the past. Okay, well, let's, uh, we're coming to the end of the show. So we'll just quickly wrap through what's caught your eye in Punchline. I'm going to start with you actually, Tally. So what's caught your eye this week's Punchline? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I just want to, the, the skill shortage is quite important actually in Gloucestershire and hospitality. We were out last night for dinner to support one of our local establishments. I have to say it was Teatro next to the Barn Theatre. They were 100% nailing it. The service was amazing. And I said to them, do you know what? You're making this look effortless, but the hard work that's going into this is phenomenal. The food's amazing. The service is amazing. You're working so hard. And they said, we're trying to find two chefs and we're advertising and we're just not getting anyone applying. And I just thought that's the bit that's pressurizing businesses. You put it in your punchline yesterday, the skill shortage in Gloucestershire. So that's the bit I really hope Hope, um, that businesses are able to find staff to, to keep going because they're working so hard. Um, but I also love the fact I was at the Gloucester Docks yesterday for a meeting. It was great face to face meetings. Um, and the Gloucester Brewery um, is announcing major docks expansion. I've not been there yet, but I'm very excited. I love a brewery. 
Um, and if they're expanding, that's brilliant news. And in an area which is starting to look amazing and the investment going on. So um, I think Punchline's doing a very good job at keeping me up to date. But just a quick one. I love the fact we've got a Gloucestershire firm first with the graphene and concrete. Oh my God, this is amazing. How innovative are our businesses in Gloucestershire? I'm always astounded by these businesses I've never heard of before doing world leading things. Um, and the fact that may, they're making material um, that, that's going to help the environment. I mean, concrete's one of the worst things for the environment and what they're doing is absolutely phenomenal. So if you get a chance, read the full article because it's absolutely fascinating. Neil Ricketts, the CEO of Vissarian, I just think they're doing amazing stuff. And Neil Ricketts is today's big interview, by the way. So, ah. uh, right, we're going to quickly go over to Julie. Julie, I'm running out of time, unfortunately. So, I know I'm going to talk forward. quickly. I'm going to talk quickly. The best article you wrote this week was obviously about Brunsden's Insurance supporting our Walk for Wellbeing Week, which starts now. Sunday, Roger Head is opening Highland Court, so please go and walk around his gardens on Sunday. Next Friday, there's a night walk around the business park, Huckaker and Brockworth. And next Sunday, it's from Belmont School that we supply um, equipment to because it's a special school. And we're going to finish off there by going over Let Campton Hill. Right, John, what have we got, please? <laughs> well, uh, coming back to the service sector, um, disturbingly, 500 attacks a day on retail staff in the, in the country, um, which made me very impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Nice. Thank you very much, John. Sorry, I'm going to have to move you on. Uh, Steve, what have you picked out for us, please? Yeah, uh, Wednesday, new visitor information centre um, in Dursley. Uh, obviously, I chair the visitor economy group for the LEP. And what we always discuss on our quarterly meetings is how important our tourist information centres are, that local lead into information for visitors when they're coming into the area and how, where they, how they can get to places and where they can visit. That local level service is just as important as the kind of national perspective and the work we do at like DMO level. So just a big shout out to the TICs and how valuable the work they do is. Thank you very much, guys. And the story that really caught my eye and uh, our redesign was actually Amazon and the 120,000 square feet. I know we talked about it earlier, but that was, to me, the story of the week. Thank you ever so much for joining Punchline Talks, guys, and see you all very soon.